Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's stream. We are kicking off an exciting series that are going to help you guys to submit amazing projects for our brand new Lensathon. Today, I'm joined by a really special guest, uh, Laura. And if you guys haven't seen me before, my name is Elena Nizhnik, and I am an AR program manager here at Snap. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're excited to have this session with you, and please. Welcome, Laura. And Laura, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, like Elena said, I'm Laura. I'm an AR engineer here at Snap. Um, I work on a team that builds Lens Studio. And yeah, I'm so happy to be here today to talk to you about uh, one of my favorite topics, 3D hand tracking. And so, you so guys before... Yeah, go for it, Elena. Go ahead, Laura. So you, you know that uh, we love to do these, um, you know, live events for you, especially during our Lensathons. Uh, we're kicking this off a little bit early in December because the Lensathon is the Lensathon is live, but you do have until January 31st to actually submit your work. So, Laura, I think that you prepared some slides and we actually have the links for you if you haven't already registered and we'll tell you a lot more about the actual Lensathon. And of course, Laura will give you the ins and outs of the 3D hand tracking. Yeah, so make sure you sign up for the Lensathon. The link is here, snapar.com slash Lensathon. Um, can't wait to see what you build. Hopefully some of them include 3D hand tracking, uh, which we should get you set up with today with this workshop. So getting started, um, there's so much that you can do with 3D hand tracking. But one of the great things in general about the feature is that it can really um, take your lenses up a level in terms of interactivity and leveraging 3D space, making your lenses spatial. Uh, and there's there's so many other features that you can combine um, 3D hand tracking with. So some examples here, you can do hands in physics. You can do hand gestures and combine that with a procedural mesh, uh, like in these drawing lenses. Um, you can also add some visual effects 
and attach that to the hand so you get to do you know these magical things that you can't do in real life uh, so there's so much we can cover what we're going to cover today uh, is here on the slide so i'm going to point you towards some resources where you can learn more about 3d hand tracking i'm going to show you kind of a teaser of different types of interactions that you can include in your lenses uh, we're going to dive into the 3D hand tracking asset, take a close, closer look at how it works, um, what it does, and then we're going to prototype a lens. So put it all together and build something. Um, just a note here that I'm using Lens Studio version 4.34. Um, so if you're tuning in later, um, just a reference that what I'm doing here is 4.34. This workshop is for you. Um, I want to make sure that you get the most out of it. So please ask questions at any time. Um, Elena is going to be keeping an eye out and ask me any questions. So yeah, just pop them in anytime uh, you have one. These are some things that I want to make sure you know um, before we get into the details. So 3D hand tracking works on both mobile and spectacles. It works best with nice bright lighting. Um, it includes both single hand tracking and 2D hand tracking. So that was recently added. Um, so you can track one hand at a time or now you can track two hands at a time, which is exciting. It works both on your front and back cameras on your mobile phone. And for those of you who are building on spectacles, um, there's this awesome feature called live tracking mode in Lens Studio, which makes it really easy to test your 3D hand tracking lenses right in Lens Studio. You put your spectacles on and it streams your hand data into the interactive preview. So check that out if you're building on spectacles. So getting into some resources, there are a number of hand tracking templates in Lens Studio. Um, these ones that I call it here are specifically 3D hand tracking, which is what we're focusing on today. So that uh, means that the lens is detecting the position and rotation of your hand in three dimensions um, versus 2D, which some of the other templates are. So 3D hand tracking, 3D hand interactions, 3D hand VFX. Check those out if you want to learn more about those topics. And then I also want to call out that the 3D body um, template has been updated to now include hand tracking. So before the body tracking asset did not include hands, but now it does, which is really exciting too. In the asset library, um, there's an asset called hand physics, and this is what I'm going to be focusing on today. So you can do a lot with this asset. Um, it's called hand physics, but it's not just good for physics actually. It includes an occluder, it has a mesh collider. Uh, it also comes with a script called hand tracking, which is uh, provides a scripting API to get that hand data into other scripts. So you can do your own custom interactions and um, yeah, get, get kind of into the details uh, with the position and rotation data. Here's a preview of what we're going to build today. Um, so this is a prototype that I've dubbed ChemTutor. So it's an education lens, and um, the motivation here is taking, in this case, chemistry, uh, an education experience, and you know where we might typically learn about chemical molecules from you know 2D textbooks or videos. In this lens, we can take that into 3D, so we can see a molecule. Um, 3D model, and we can interact with it. We can rotate it. Uh, we can point to select the mon molecule that we want to choose. And we can also pinch and drag to scale. So these are the interactions that I'm going to show you how to build. Laura, what a cool lens. And I with if we had them in our classroom when we were studying chemistry, we probably would enjoy it a whole lot more. And just a, what an incredible way to visualize something that sometimes is hard to imagine when it's presented to you on a 2D piece of paper, even if it's visualized in a 3D uh, way. Absolutely. Yeah, we we are spatial. We understand things in three dimensions. So getting things, you know, off a 2D page into three dimensions, um, I think there's like a ton of opportunity there for education and other lenses. Yeah. So are there, just before we jump into Lens Studio, um, just want to check if there's any questions so far. If not, we will hop over. So far, lens studio. Uh, questions. Um, uh, so we can probably get into the Lens Studio and what you do. Okay. Next. And while you're getting to Lens Studio, Laura, I'll just mention really quickly that um, everybody this time around, uh, the team that put together the Lensathon for you has even more prizes. There are more categories in which you can win. Um, I did drop a link to the website. Uh, if you guys need it, I can drop it again. But we just encourage you to participate and you know. Um, 
play around with your creativity. And of course, if you're looking to collaborate with somebody else who you love working with in the AR space, um, we are encouraging collaborations in teams of up to three people. So go ahead, uh, play with your wildest ideas, make them innovative, push the future forward. And we're looking forward to see what you will submit. Again, you'll have until January 31st. So uh, we'll have six more live streams for you in January as well to join and check out um, other tech that will be breaking down, but you can get started now because it's never too early. So get started and register if you haven't done so already. All right, so here we are in Lens Studio. Um, like I mentioned, this is going to be kind of like a teaser of different interactions, and then we'll get into the details in the prototype. But uh, let me, okay, let me just show you the first one here. So you can track an object to the hand. So here you can see I have these 3D text objects that are being tracked to each of my fingers. Uh, the next one here is simple gestures. So we can get, um, like based on the position data of our joints, we can define different gestures. So here I'm comparing the distance between my thumb tip and my index fingertip. And you can see here, this is showing the distance between them. And once they get close enough, we have a pinch active. You can also do hand colliders. So this blue mesh that you see on my hand, this is a mesh collider. Um, and this is gonna let me interact with other physics colliders like this, which is pretty fun. We also have touch. So just like we um, reach out and touch things in real life, we can touch, oh, there we go. <laughs> we can touch AR objects. This is also using the collider on my hand and there's a collider on the sphere. Um, and when that collision is detected, we can have some behavior happen. Um, in AR, we can also do things that maybe we can't necessarily do in real life. So we can um, detect when an object or when our hand is getting close to an object, but not touching and have something happen. So that's measuring the distance between my hand and the object. And once I get within range, you know, some behavior happens. Uh, we can also point at objects. So maybe there's some AR objects that are, you know, out in front of us, out of our reach. We can also point at them to interact with them. And this is using um, an operation called a dot product, which we'll get into more later. Uh, but the numbers here represent the dot product, which returns a value between zero and one. You can see when I'm pointing, the value gets closer to one. And when I'm not pointing at it, it gets, uh, if I'm pointing in the opposite direction, it gets closer to negative one. So that's a really useful operation that you'll want to know about. And hand direction. So maybe we want to have um, a lens where something shows up in our hand when we put our, our palm in front of us and, and face it upwards. So you can have something happen based on the direction your hand is facing. Uh, and last but not least, hand VFX. So VFX always kind of adds some magic to your lens and you can have VFX spawn from your hand. So yeah, pretty magical. So that was a preview. Um, we're going to build out some of these interactions. If there's any of these that you're still curious about when we get to the end, um, let us know and we can come back and take a closer look. Lauren, we actually have a question from Tom. Tom is asking, is it possible to let the hand collide with an object, then use LiDAR to point if at a wall or, some, or something rather, uh, they're looking to throw a ball at the wall. Is it is it possible? Let us know if the question is clear to you. So you can use um, World Mesh, which uh, you don't have to have a LiDAR phone, but it does work really well with LiDAR phones. So you could have use the World Mesh um, and then have your ball or your object that you want to throw, put a collider onto that. And then um, it would take, probably the, the tricky part would be just applying the force and like getting a, some type of gesture to happen where you release the ball. But then the ball, the collider on the ball, uh, when it collides with the world mesh, you could detect that and you know have something happen. So yeah, it, it, it is possible if I'm understanding your question right. Thanks, Laura. Okay, I'm just going to change my layout a little bit, um, get back into kind of a lens setup. So yeah, we're gonna start uh, building out our prototype. So the first thing 
we need to do is get the hand tracking asset into our project. So there's a couple ways. If you just want to like totally start from scratch, um, you can come in here to the objects panel and find um, under object tracking 3D. You can import the hand tracking asset from here. What I'm going to do is go find that um, hand physics asset that I mentioned earlier and import that. So that's appeared here in the resources panel. It tells me put under main cam. So I'm going to do that. Try it up here. And now you can see I have all um, these new objects in the scene. So this right here, the 3D hand tracking left and right, this is uh, what's making 3D hand tracking possible. This is the asset. Um, we're gonna take a closer look at this. We don't really need this example that it comes with. Uh, I kind of like having this toggle collider. I'm gonna keep that, but I'll get rid of the example. Um, and the 3D hand tracking asset, uh, if we take a look here in the expector panel, you can, we can kind of start to understand what's happening. Um, so there's different tracking modes that you can set on the asset. And there's two that I wanna draw your attention to. So if you wanna have a hand mesh, um, and that includes an occ occluder, um, colliders, or if you like wanna have your, your own custom um, hand rig that's like, you know, a cat paw or a puppet or something like that, um, you'll wanna use this proportions and pose. If you want to um, get the position and rotation data of specific joints using this hand tracking script, um, we're going to change that to attachment. And I actually want to do both. So what I'm going to do is duplicate both of these. Um, what you can see here, we have left and right. So I'm going to identify these as mesh and just leave them as is. So this is um, for my occluder and my collider mesh. I'm just gonna leave that as proportions and pose. But on these other ones, I wanna have that position and rotation data. So I'm gonna change these to left and right attachment. Don't really need that too, but that's all right. Um, and I also don't need the hand rig in order to get that position and rotation data. So I can delete that. So going in here, I'm gonna update the tracking mode to attachment. And again, this is because I wanna use this in the hand tracking script to get position and rotation data of my hand and joints. So I'm gonna update the inputs to my hand tracking script. Um, the meshes will be the same. And yeah, now we're, now we're ready to start using the assets, but taking a little bit closer look, you can see here that uh, it lists out all of the attachment points. So if you are using your own hand rig, you wanna make sure that the bone structure follows what's listed here. And then once you import um, your own rig into the project, if that's what you wanna do, you can click match hierarchy, choose your hand rig, okay? And it will just auto populate all of these. Well, uh, we don't need that, yeah. Uh, Utam is asking, why are the right and left prefabs rotated by 90 degrees? That is, um, so the, when you add both a left and right hand to um, the scene here, this kind of differentiates which one's left and which one is right. So uh, I think the left one, oh, no, this is right and this is left. So I don't, I don't know that there's like specifically a reason for that. It's just to let you know that there's a difference between the two. Um, but there, yeah, there's not really like a specific difference that I can call out at least uh, that you need to kind of keep in mind or be aware of. Thanks for letting us know. Okay, and I also want to point out down here in the resources panel, we have a folder hand physics resources that's got imported with the asset. It has um, data, this is the tracking assets that are attached to these scene objects. And this is where you can go in and decide if you want single hand tracking or simultaneous two hand tracking. If you want to use two hands, then of course set it to two hand tracking. If you only need one hand, it can be like a little bit better for performance if you check that um, single hand tracking. So I only really need single hand tracking, so I'll set it to that. All right, now let's take a look at the hand tracking script. So this is a great script. It's gonna look a little bit overwhelming as I get into it here. 
you don't need to worry about a lot of this unless you want to, by all means, go check it out. Um, but this has scripting APIs that you can call from other scripts to access all of this hand data. So the first thing you're going to do, um, and I'll show you how to do this in the actual script, is call this get hand. So this will give you the hand um, asset that has all the data. There's a hand object up here. Uh, again, don't be overwhelmed by all of this code. That's not the point. Um, but here we have a hand object and it has all of these uh, methods and properties that you can access. So things like back, down, forward, those are directions that I was using um, in that example of like having an open palm and having an object appear. Um, you can also access fingers, um, middle finger, ring finger example. So that's how you access specific fingers, index finger, we're gonna use that a lot. And then once you have the finger, um, you can access more methods and properties specific to that finger. So um, you can get array, which is the direction that it's pointing. Uh, we'll also be able to get uh, specific joint information. So that position and rotation, rotation uh, which we're definitely interested in. So this, um, you don't, again, don't need to know the details, but I'll show you as we build out this lens, how to access all of these properties and methods um, to build an interaction. Okay, so we will start building. Let's just check any other questions so far. So far, so good. Utam just had uh, a comment based on the question that um, we asked earlier that, uh, first of all, thank you, Laura. And Utam says, in the past, I had particularly difficulties in positioning objects with the prefab rotated. But what happened is that moving an object in one direction in the scene would actually move it in the other direction in the output. So um, that was the comment from Utam. But otherwise, we have no other questions, Laura. Thanks for yeah. Thanks for that extra comments. There is one thing to be aware of that um, the right and, and the left hand might look different in the preview window. So you might have something defined as a left hand, and in the preview you're using your right hand. Um, that's just something to be aware of uh, if if you're just like a little bit confused about the mismatch. So I will start off by importing the models of. Uh, the chemical compounds that are going to be part of the lens. So I have the models here. So the three that we're going to be showing in the lens are carbon dioxide, glucose, and water. So I'll import those. You can see them coming into the resources panel. I'm going to drag these prefabs up into my scene so we can see them. Here we go. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to change the transforms a little bit. These are a little bit too big. I want them smaller. So I'll change their scales one by one. The glucose is a little bit bigger, so I'll make it slightly smaller than the others. Okay, there we go. So the first thing that we are gonna do um, is build out our rotation interaction. So what I wanna be able to do is have my hand here in the lens and rotate it and have that rotate the molecule that is currently selected. So we'll start by adding a script and we'll call this, uh, I'm gonna call this the like manipulate, spelling that right, manager. So this is gonna handle both rotation and scale, but we're gonna start with rotation. So we will need to have an update event, uh, create event, update event, which we're gonna bind to a function called on update. Let's add that function in here. So this on update is going to get called every single frame. Oops. And the first thing we want to do in here is get our hand data. So like um, I showed you in that hand tracking script, we can call global uh, dot hand tracking dot get hand. And this is going to, if, if there's um, a hand in that's being detected, it will return us that hand. If there's not a hand being detected, we want to handle that. Um, it's going to return undefined. And if there's no hand detected, we don't want to do anything else. We're just going to return. Uh, okay, so we have our hand data. Now we want to define a rotate function and it's going to use that hand data. So down here, uh, we have rotate 
and and I'm going to define a variable up here. Um, this script is going to get attached to each of the molecules in the scene. So uh, I'm going to be using the transform of the object a few times. So I'm just going to define a variable here that's transform. And it's going to get the scene object and get its transform. Uh, and then down here in our rotate function, um, it's pretty simple. We're just going to do transform dot set world rotation, and we're going to set it to the rotation of our hand. So we can put hand, which we've received uh, as a parameter to the function dot rotation. So I need to attach this. Uh, we'll use carbon dioxide as our tester for now, but we're going to attach this to each of the molecules. And let's try to have a typo here. Save that. So now we can see as I rotate my hand, my molecule is also rotating. Lauren, we had a quick question from Tom. Tom is asking mm -hmm. if you are using Python. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we are using JavaScript, correct? JavaScript, yeah, that's right. We're using JavaScript. Okay, so we have our rotate interaction. Now we're going to do our scale interaction. So for the scale interaction, um, in rotate, we just have our hand open. For scale, we need to kind of differentiate between when we want to rotate versus when we want to scale. So to do that, we can use a pinch gesture and we're going to pinch and drag to have it like scale up and scale down. So we're going to want to define our pinch gesture and we're going to, going to want to keep track of when the pinch gesture is um, active. So we're going to have a Boolean here that we'll call pinch active. Set that to false to start. Um, and then if our pinch is active, we're going to want to scale, which we'll define in a little bit. Um, and if it's not active, so else, we're going to rotate the hand. So you can see now, uh, actually, I should just add scale here for now. We'll define that in a second. So now, if I save this, you can see, uh, oh, I don't have my I don't have my pinch defined yet. That's not very helpful. Um, okay, so in order to know if uh, pinch is active, we need to detect if there's a pinch. So let's have a function here that's called detect pinch, and we'll give it our hand data, and let's define that. So detect pinch. Let's take a look. How do we define the pinch? So uh, this is a pretty straightforward gesture. It's the distance between our thumb and index finger um, gets pretty close to zero when we're in a pinch. And when the hand is open, um, we're not pinched. So that's pretty easy to define. We're gonna wanna get our um, thumb tip position and our index tip position, get the distance between them, and then compare that, compare that to some thresholds. So if we get our thumb position from the hand, it's just hand dot thumb dot tip uh, dot position. And then for our index finger, we'll do thumb dot index finger dot tip dot position. You can see the pattern here, how to get position. Note that um, tip, because it's used most often, has its own reference. If you wanted to get a different joint, you would call get joint and give the number of the joint on the thumb. But in this case, we can just use tip. We want to get the distance between these two joints. So we'll do thumb dot index, oops, distance dot index. So this is a method uh, that you can call, call to get the distance between two 3D vectors. And then we want to define some Threshold. So while in a pinch um, gesture, the distance is like past, it's basically zero. There's going to be some variability as the lens is detecting the pinch. So we're going to have some um, like cutoff. So some distance that below that, we're calling it a pinch. So we'll say that's something like 
um, some small value, value, but greater than zero, something like three. So we're going to say, if this distance between our thumb and index, index finger tips is less than our threshold, then we're going to set pinch active equals true. And if this is not the case, the distance is greater than three, uh, greater than or equal to three, we're going to set this to false. Okay, so now, now let's see if we will also just have a print statement here, um, pinch active, so we can double check in our logs. But now let's see if we do a pinch, we have pinch active, you can see that in the print statement. And you'll also notice that the rotation is happening. So if we open up our hand, rotation happens. As soon as we pinch, we've said, if the pinch is active, don't rotate. So now you can see it's not rotating. Cool. So now we can define our scale function. Um, the scale function is a little more interesting. We're going to want to get a couple of inputs um, for each molecule. So we're going to define some inputs. We're going to say a float for a max scale. So this is the biggest size we want the molecule to be. We'll set that to 1.5 by default. Uh, we're going to set another float for min scale. We'll set this to 0.5 by default. Um, and then the last one here is a max. Here we go. Max distance. Um, we'll set that to 30. So as we're dragging our pinch. Um, we want some range that we're going to scale over, but we don't want it to like scale forever and have our molecule blow up. Um, maybe that'd be cool, but in this case, we're not going to do that. So this max distance is the maximum distance we care that we've dragged. And we're going to scale um, between this range that we've set between the minimum scale and the maximum scale. So if I uh, drag all the way to 30 centimeters, then it's going to get to the maximum scale. And if I drag uh, zero centimeters, then it's going to be our minimum scale. So we're going to use that uh, information in our scale function. We want to, uh, actually, there's a couple more things we need. So we're going to need a start position. So when that pinch is active, um, where is it in space? What's its, what's its position? Uh, to start, we'll just set this to, to zero. And then we want a Boolean here to check, um, has the start pose been set? Because we only need to do that once. So if the start pose has not been set, then we want to get our start pose. And we're going to get that. We'll use the, the position of the index finger tip as our like reference position uh, for where we are in space. So we actually did that before. We can just copy and paste. Get our index finger tip. Laura, and speaking of copy and pasting, would it be possible for us to share the script with our community after the stream is over? Just so that if anybody actually is going to create a lens where they want to use interactions that you're showing today, maybe they could have a little shortcut. For sure. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Definitely. Out in the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Rule breakers. Okay, so we if, if the start position is not set, we're going to get that start pose, then we're going to set our Boolean start pose set to true. Um, now we're going to check um, how far we've moved. So we're going to have the distance that we've moved uh, relative to our start position. Um, so with, e with each frame that, you know, as this odd update function is running, as our hand moves, we want to keep checking the distance that we've moved relative to our start position. Um, so we're going to get our current position uh, again, copy and paste, just like when we get to copy and paste. Um, so our current position of the index finger, and then we're going to get the distance from the start pose using that distance function again. 
Uh, and now we want to map that to our, our range between the minimum scale and maximum scale. So I'm going to have a variable here that I'll call uh, a multiplier, which we're, yeah, I'll, I'll do this first. Um, so we're going to have a multiplier that, uh, which we'll have our range here is going to be our max scale minus our, yeah, so this is the, the range um, that we're going to, the scale, the obstacle between. And then this multiplier is going to be the proportion of that range uh, that we want to scale based on the distance we've traveled. So we're going to do range times the proportion, the distance that we traveled compared to the maximum distance we care to travel. Uh, and then we want to add back in the minimum distance since, or sorry, minimum scale, since we never want to be below that scale. Okay, um, so we have our multiplier now. We need to turn that into a 3D vector, which will be ultimately the scale that we set. Um, so we're gonna have a vec3 that's just ones. Um, and we're going to uniform scale by this multiplier. So this multiplies every element x, y, z in our 3D vector by this multiplier. Now we have our scale, we're ready to update, set the scale of our molecule. So we have this transform we defined earlier, and then we'll do set world scale to that scale. So let's see, hopefully no typos, let's see if this works. So we still have our rotation, we have our pinch, and now as I move my hand in and out, we can see our molecule changing scale, which is pretty fun. And again, we can still rotate. Cool, so that's um, two interactions we can check off. We have our rotate and we have our pinch and drag to scale. So yeah, I find this pretty fun. Okay, so now um, the next piece is a little more involved, um, but this is gonna be uh, choosing between the different molecules. So this is going to be our point to select. Uh, I'm going to disable this now. And just to tidy things up a little bit, I'm going to group these models under a models object. Um, and I'm going to, so what I'm going to have is like a menu of the compound names up at the top here that I can point at to select and show the molecule in the middle here. So I'm gonna create an object that's called the menu. And these are just gonna be text objects um, that will say, so let's say this is CO2. Uh, here we go. Let's make this a little bit smaller. Choose a different font. Um, and we'll move this up to the position we want it in. So this is our first one. I'm going to duplicate this two times. For glucose and water. Oops, I want this all caps. Lauren, while you were talking, um, Tom has another question. Uh, and the question is, what if you stop the pinch at a certain point? Can you scale infinitely? And I guess that's what you were just trying to explain, right, about the limit on the scale. Yeah, yeah, I'll take another stab, uh, making it a little bit clearer. So we could have it that you just, you know, drag forever um, and the molecule keeps scaling and scaling. Um, but that's not like, you know, maybe not, not like the, the most useful experience. Um, so there's some kind of maximum, like minimum scale we want the model to be and some maximum scale we want the model to be. And we're gonna map that to some like distance range to a scale range. So we only care if our hand moves 30 centimeters. So if it moves zero, we're gonna set the molecule to the minimum scale. If we move to our maximum distance, which we said was 30, we're gonna set the molecule to the maximum scale. And if it's somewhere in between, we're gonna scale it to some proportion of that range. So hopefully um, it's a little bit more clear. 
Yeah, but technically, but, uh, you've talked if it's not more like fantastical and really exaggerated. Technically, you yeah. could so that you scale infinitely, right? And like it just becomes yeah bigger than life at that it's point. Huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could, uh, yeah, you could do that. You could change the maximum distance that you care about. Um, yeah, whatever, whatever makes most sense and then achieves the vision that you have for your lens. Okay, so I was setting up these, our menu items. So this is what we want to be able to point at and then have our molecule show up. Um, so we're going to need two more scripts. One of them is going to be called, I'm going to call it the target manager. And this is going to get attached to each of these menu items. Um, and each menu item is going to kind of check for, uh, it's going to help check if it's being pointed at. So this um, brings up a topic that I mentioned earlier. It's called the dot product. This comes into play here when you're pointing at objects. Um, so I have a little demo here. I'll just, uh, if you're wondering why there's this dot product object. Um, so we're going to give you a little visual of what the dot product means. So dot product is an algebraic operation that can that will tell you how uh, much two vectors are pointing in the same direction so if we have my two fingers here we'll see if this is going to cooperate for me if i have my oh you know what i think i need to set the data back to two hand tracking because i want to detect both my hands okay so if i have both my hands here, you can see this, ignore the you know, fluctuating meshes, but you can see this number goes up closer to one because the two directions, like the, my two fingers are, are pointing in the same direction. If I point in different directions, this is gonna turn negative. Um, and I don't think it's detecting both my hands. So it's gonna turn negative, go towards negative one so two vectors pointing in the same direction, the dot product comes back as one or close to one. If they're pointing in exactly opposite directions, it's gonna return negative one. And if they're perpendicular, so at 90 degrees to each other, this is gonna come back um, close to zero. So that's really useful information because if I am, I get my menu items here. Um, if I am pointing at one of my menu items, I can check the direction between my index finger and my menu item. And then I can check the direction my finger is pointing and see how parallel those are to figure out which item I'm pointing at. So it's um, maybe a little bit to wrap your head around if it's not something you're familiar with. Uh, but the main thing you need to understand is you can use this dot operation to get about a value back uh, about two vectors We'll give you a value back between zero and one, which minus one uh, and one, which tells you how much two vectors are pointing in the same direction. And we're going to use that in our um, select gesture. So I have that disabled. I have my menu items here. Um, and we're going to continue building this out. So in our target manager, so keep that in mind, dot product, we're going to come back to that and, and implement it here. Uh, but we're going to keep going with our target manager. So this is going to get attached to each of the menu items, and it's going to control what happens if I am pointing at that item uh, and what happens if I'm not pointing at the item. So we're going to have two functions here. Um, target, so this is what happens. Oops, I don't need that. If I am the item that's being pointed at, and I'll have another function on target. And the last thing I'm gonna have is a function here called get dot product. Just gonna use the hand data. So we'll come back to this one. Um, when the item is being pointed at, I wanna have some visual feedback uh, that that is the item that's being pointed back at. So I'm just gonna scale up the item title here a little bit. And if it's untargeted, not being pointed at, I'm going to scale that back down to a smaller scale. So I'll have here a variable that's targeted, scale. Uh, we're going to have a vec3. Um, so if it's targeted, we want it to be bigger. 
So we'll make it a little bit bigger than one. If we are untargeted, so untargeted scale, we'll set this back to one. And have an extra comma. Okay, like we did before, since this script is getting attached to the object itself that we're um, changing, we're gonna get the transform so we can easily uh, type a little bit less for one thing over and over. We'll get the scene object. So we're gonna be using them transform multiple times. Get transform. So for targeting, we said we're going to transform set world scale to our targeted scale. If we are untargeting, we're gonna set that to our untargeted scale. The other thing that we want to happen when we're pointing at the item is we want the molecule that corresponds to that title uh, to show up. So we're going to have an input here. Each item in the menu is going to have a reference to its corresponding model. And when we're targeted, we're going to enable that model. So enabled equals true. And if we are not targeting the item, we're going to set the model enabled to false. So I need to go in here and attach or give the references to the models. Make sure I'm grabbing the right ones, glucose to glucose, water to water. Okay, so we don't have the pointer set up, so nothing's gonna happen yet, um, but this is handling how, uh, like what shows up in the lens when we're pointing at an object and when we're not pointing at an object. So now we're going to get um, the job product. We're going to we're going to set up this function. So um, as we said, we need two direction vectors, and we can get we can build those direction vectors uh, based on the positions of the item title and of our finger. So we're going to get our own position, our own as the the title here in the menu. We're going to get our own position. So get world position. We're going to get um, the index finger positions from the hand data. Here we go. And dot index finger dot position. You might recall we used that earlier. And I needed the tip. And we can construct a direction vector from these two positions. So we're going to have a direction vector that's called um, direction to index and we're going to do put our item position subtract the index position and very important you need to normalize so if you get back some funky values and you don't know what's going on in your code check that you have normalized your direction vector this is very important um, normalizing the direction vector sets its length to one and if we want the dot product to return a value that's um, the expected negative one to one, the input uh, direction vector needs to be of length one, which is all to say, make sure you normalize your direction vectors. We're also gonna get the direction of our index finger. So what direction is our index finger pointing? And we can get that from our hand data, index finger. There's a method there called get ray. Uh, and that returns the direction that the, the finger you specified is pointing. Okay, so now we've gotten to a point where we get to do our dot product. We're gonna have dot function. Uh, so to do the dot product, we just take our one direction vector, dot that with our second direction vector. We want this function to return the dot. Okay, so I know that was probably a lot. I'll pause there for a second. Uh, if there's any questions, but this is all this get dot product function is checking is our finger, you know, what direction is our finger pointing compared to what direction the item is. And if this item is the one that we're going to point at, we're going to target it. If it's not the one being pointed at, we're going to untarget it. Here so far, we don't have any questions, so feel free to keep on going. Cool. All right. We have one more piece here. Um, we're in the home stretch. We're gonna have a pointer manager. 
Uh, we're going to attach, we'll take, create a scene object here. That's the pointer and attach this pointer manager. And what this pointer manager is going to do is um, compare the dot products of each of our three items and figure out which one is the most parallel. Um, so let's get started with that. Okay, so we're gonna need um, an update event again. We can go back to our manipulate manager, do some more copying and pasting. So this, again, we're gonna have a function that runs with every frame of the lens. Um, and again, we want to get our hand data. Uh, so we're using that global.handtracking.getHand to get the hand data. If there's no hand present, we also want to do something else here. So if there's no hand being detected, um, that means that we don't want any of our items to be targeted. So we can have a function here that's called untarget all. Um, in order to write this function, we need to um, get access to the script, the targeting script on each of these menu items. So we can do that by defining an input that's a script component. There we go. Uh, we're going to have an array of script components because we're going to take all three in. We'll call this items. So if we add these in here, Now, if we want to untarget all of them, uh, we can call for, do a for loop that goes through each of the items. Uh, yeah. I less than script dot items dot link. And it's going to say script dot items untarget. So this is going to go through each of the items and untarget. Okay, we also want to detect if we have a point gesture. Point gesture. Um, so we only want to do this selection if our hand is in the point gesture. And this will di differentiate between when our palm is open and we're rotating versus when our hand is uh, pointing to choose an item. So we're going to define our point gesture very similar to how we did our detect pinch. So we can copy and paste that function. Uh, and we're going to change this to detect pointer. So as I'm updating this, um, you can think to yourself, how, how might we define a point gesture? Um, and the way that I'd suggest, there's, there's a number of different ways that you can do it. Um, but for me, when I look at having an open palm versus being in this point gesture, one of the kind of defining features is the distance between my thumb and my middle finger. So I'm going to compare the distance of my thumb tip um, and one of these end middle joints. So I'll keep my thumb here, but I want to compare it to my middle finger. So instead of index, we're using middle. Uh, middle. I'll show you how you can use this get joint. Uh, position. So we're going to use a third joint instead of calling that a tip. And the distance, we're going to compare the thumb to the middle finger. So if our distance is less than some threshold, we need to go back and define our threshold. Um, like before, we can set it to some value that's close to zero, but not zero. So we'll choose three again. So if the distance between our thumb and our middle, uh, one of the middle end joints is less than three, then our pointer is active. Otherwise, pointer is not active. So we want, again, uh, pointer active Boolean. We'll set to false to begin. So if our pointer is active, um, then we want to target an object, which we'll define. If it's not active, um, we're not going to do anything else, so we'll just leave it at that. So we have one more function to define, which is our 
uh, target target object. I guess we'll be consistent. We'll call it item. Target item using that hand data. Okay, so what this is gonna do is it's gonna ask each of the items, hey, what's your dot product? And then it's gonna compare those three dot products, figure out which one is the best, which one is being pointed at the most, uh, and it's gonna target that item and untarget the others. So we're gonna have a couple of for loops, which means we can do some copy and pasting from before. Um, so for each item, we wanna do script.items, um at i dot get dot product product using that hand data we're going to put that in a variable which we'll call dot okay so for each item we're getting our dot product um we need to have something to compare it to so i'm going to have a variable here that's the best dot set that to negative one to start since it's negative one means that um, you're pointing exactly the opposite direction. We're going to have our best uh, index. So which item is the current best index? The current best item. And once we have our dot, we're going to check if our current dot is greater than our best dot. Then we're going to update our best dot to be the current dot because it is now the best dot. It was better than the old dot. Um, and we're going to set our best index to be our current index. All right. So now after this for loop, we know which item is being targeted, which item is being pointed at the most. So we're going to have one more for loop to target and untarget each of the items. So if um, the use a different, I'll maybe use a different variable here just to be safe. So if our current index um, equals the best index, right, then we're going to target the index that we're at. Otherwise, we are going to untarget. Oops. So we have our pointer. Um, the lens says, hey, items, tell me what your dot product is. It compares those, those dot products, finds the one that is being pointed at the most. It targets that item and it untargets the rest. Okay, did I need to name the functions the same thing? Okay, so let's give it a shot. So now if I'm pointing at an item, we don't have the item being enabled. Let me check that I did that right. We populated the items. We're coming up on the hour, so we'll try and wrap this up. This is how you all know that this is live development because, you know, <laughs> yeah. real time right in front of you. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm doing something wrong that's not enabling the model, but you can see that the items are getting highlighted. Um, and what should be happening is the model should be showing up so I can do those rotate and scale interactions. Um, so I can double check this, but um, maybe if there's any other questions in the meantime, uh, yeah, we can answer those and wrap up. So far, Laura, there aren't any questions in chat. I think everybody's just glued to the screen to watch you uh, to the <laughs> JavaScript magic. So um, yeah, if, if you all have any questions, um, now would be an awesome time to ask while Laura is still live. And as you can see, Laura is... Um, Quite a wizard when it comes to all things JavaScript and Lens Studio. So do ask your questions. This video, this stream will be converted to a video, so you'll be able to pause and follow at your own pace if you wish to do it later. Uh, but you know, right now is a great time to ask questions. 
an issue. Uh, just if you're curious, I had the models uh, disabled, so I just enabled those, and now you can see the point. The point works. Mm -hmm. Rotate and scale. So yeah, I know this is a lot. Um, if this was interesting to you, come back, check out the video, and uh, yeah, we'll try to get these resources, these scripts uh, available to you to check out in detail. And I also, once the stream converts to a video, I will link in the top comment uh, some pinned links to additional documentation and resources. Uh, we'll work with Laura to see if we can grab some of the script that um, she's wrote today, and we'll share it with you if you all want to just, you know, play with it, experiment, and try to bring it in your own project. So do check back um, probably in a few hours or so. We'll try to get it all uh, collected and combined. And again, if you have any questions, let us know. Uh, if you have questions later, do comment um, under the video. We do check those comments as well. And we have six more live streams coming up in January for the Lensathon. We also have one live stream tomorrow, which actually is happening in Arabic for our Arabic speaking community. So join and check that out as well. But for now, um, if you'll have questions, do ask Laura. We have one question from Julio. And the question is, is GitHub repository, um, is it going to feature this example later? Yeah, we'll see um, how we can get that to you, whether that's on GitHub or just project files. Um, but so whatever the format, we'll get it available to you. Great. So check back later. Um, again, when the video is converted, when the live stream is converted to the video, check back on the channel and uh, hopefully we'll be able to link you to the correct place where you can either get the script or uh, the whole project. Um, and we have final words of affirmation and thanks. Uh, Utam is thanking you, Laura, for your time and your awesome work. Uh, we have lots of gratitude in the chat. So thank you all so much for joining us, Laura. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, if you will just flip back to your presentation so we can leave our viewers mm -hmm. with the uh, slide of the link of the Lensathon, that would be fantastic. Again, you guys, over you know, so many categories, $200,000 in prizes. Uh, do check it out, uh, participate. You have until January 31st to submit your project. And we are so excited to see what you'll come up with. Innovate, push the boundaries forward. Uh, world camera, face uh, face camera, both are allowed in this Lendathon. So um, do not limit yourself, um, you know, in what you're trying to develop. We are so excited to see what you'll come up with. Thank you for joining us.